If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. We are walking through the Sermon on the Mount. We are still in Matthew chapter 5. This is Matthew 5 is going to take up the bulk of our time through the Sermon on the Mount as we walk through these few weeks. But uh, we are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. If you were here last week, then you are set up well for this week. If you heard Pastor Matt's message, if you missed it, I'm just going to bring the, the, the key thing that you need to understand moving forward. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law as we found, meaning undermine the law. He said, but I have come to fulfill the law. Or in other words, Jesus saying, I have come to Fill the law full of meaning. That the law is, is best understood and clarified through the person of Jesus. And he says, our righteousness is found in Christ, is where we find it. Not in our works and our doing, but instead, our works and our doing is the overflow of the relationship we have with Jesus. Jesus is who makes us more righteous than that uh, the righteousness of the Pharisees. And so we have this understanding, and we've said this over and over through the Sermon on the Mount. It's easy to look at the Sermon on the Mount as individual topics, uh, isolated from one another, but the reality is, is Jesus is preaching one continuous message where these things ebb and flow and build upon each other and work together as we study to understand what it truly means to be a disciple because that's what we are called to. We've, we've shared this. The word disciple is used like 261 times in the New Testament. The word Christian is used three times. We are called to be disciples. We are Christians we're called to be disciples, fully, fo fully following Jesus, walking under his apprenticeship to be molded and shaped to be like Christ. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying it out there for his disciples. And so today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 30. We're going to talk about anger and lust. And I know you all just got really excited for the most encouraging message of your life. You're like, man, I just feel encouraged already. Anger and lust. This is really going to hit home right at the heart. But my hope and my prayer is this, that the Lord reveals understanding and clarity for us and causes shifts and change in our own hearts as we walk through this. Amen? Amen. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been accused of wishful thinking? Yeah, I, that's just pretty good, right? I think we've all been accused of wishful thinking. Now, uh, it's, ever, it's the most common time of wishful thinking is when the mega millions hits over a billion dollars. We all become wishful thinkers, do we not? It's, listen, I, I don't play the lottery. I don't get involved. I don't gamble. I am a pastor. And I hold myself to a standard at which I don't involve myself in those things. It's fine. Uh, this is not a judgmental statement. That is just, let's be good stewards of the money. Okay, and so what we find, though, is whenever the jackpot gets so high, I still find myself nonetheless going, what would it be like if... And I remember a time Strat, our oldest, was really little. And in fact, we were giving him a bath. And, and he's now almost 14. So this is a long time ago. And the mega millions at that time had hit over $700 million. And so Lauren and I are just having this conversation of what if? What would we do with $700 million? And I was like, well, after we pay taxes, because we would take the lump sum, because there's no guarantee I live long enough to receive all the money, just in case you're, if that happens. Uh, after we paid our tithes to the church, uh, from there, we started dreaming. Like, well, what could we do. And we said, we've made this agreement that we would still live in, in, a, in a regular home that we have now. We say this, hear me, without ever being, you know, given the opportunity to have this kind of money. So we're, we're praying that the Lord would just protect our hearts and get, right? But you have this, these wishful thinking, right? And so you're like, we're going to have, it'll be a nice house. It's just not going to be a wild, crazy house. It's really nice. Uh, and then we're going to drive good cars, but they're going to be paid for. We'll pay cash. It doesn't matter. And at that point, I'm going, goodness gracious, we could pay cash for any car in the world. So where, where are we putting the limit, right? You know, this kind of trying to live within, you know, reasonable, uh, you know, not trying, but we have all of these wishful things, like, College is set up. It's covered. Our kids are going to go wherever they get accepted, right? We're going to pay for it because we have the money, all, right? All of these things, like every hope and dream and all of these things that require, like, that's wishful thinking. I am never going to be given $700 million. Could it happen? Sure. Which is why it's kind of this wishful thinking. Like, there's a possibility. So, you know, Elon Musk could wake up in the morning and the Holy Spirit could speak to his heart and say, Lord, uh, I hear you. I'm going to give Ryan Dubo $700 million. It could happen. It's not going to. That's what makes it wishful thinking. We're dreaming. We're hoping. And it's easy to think about wishful thinking in those terms, but the reality is we have other ways in which we indulge in wishful thinking, and we don't ever think of them in these terms because... We don't like to admit that it's wishful thinking when it pertains to our anger directed at others. I wish they were dead. 
I wish I would have never met them. I wish they would have never been born. Or the same with lust. I wish she would look at me. I wish I could have a moment to speak to her. And we have these moments of wishful thinking that we don't like to look at. It's fun at some times and we think in, in, in good and healthy terms, it's just playing in our minds with financial things. But it takes on a different understanding when we shed it in the light of the wishful thinking that we indulge in in our sinful nature. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 is where we're going to pick up today, where we're going to begin. And he says this, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your word, Lord, that it, it is good and useful for correcting and for rebuking. And so, Father, I pray today that our hearts will be open to hear and receive your word as your Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. And Holy Spirit, what you want to shift and change in us. God, I pray that we don't put up resistance, but we allow you to work so that we can be molded and changed and transformed into the image of Christ to become the disciples you have called us to be. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. The first thing, if you're taking notes, is this. Disciples of Jesus seek peace and pursue it. The disciples of Jesus seek peace and pursue it. Let's, let's, let's begin with, it, with a basic understanding here. Jesus is, is quoting the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments, which is, you shall not murder. And I think we can all agree that is a good law. I think we're all in on the same page, that, that murder is not a good thing and that it should not have a place in our lives and it would be wonderful if it didn't have a place in this world. Amen? And then we're in agreement. We can also agree that Jesus did not come to undermine this law. He's not trying to remove that, that, that murder as, as being a, a standard of, of morality, right? He's not saying that, that murder is, is not as bad as... No, 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 no. What he's saying is that even more so, the heart matters in intent. The heart matters in our intent. And he's dealing with the anger that leads then to murder. He's saying, the Pharisees teach, don't murder. And if you don't murder, you're good to go. To which I think we could all in this room go, man, I am a righteous human being. I am so holy before the Lord, I haven't killed even one person. I am not a murderer on any level. And that was kind of the idea of what was taught. Pastor Matt last week explained to us, and in a wonderful way, that, that in that time period, most of those uh, that were there learning would be illiterate, unable to read the law and study it for themselves. And so they would find themselves only being able to understand through, through teaching and through sitting and listening and learning uh, from what was being taught to them. And the Pharisees were really good at teaching a, a kind of a, a broad spectrum of righteousness with very, very narrow understanding of what immorality is. And so they would look at a law like you shall not murder and they would say as long as you haven't killed or murdered anyone, you are not in, in danger of breaking the law. You are righteous without ever looking then at the heart or the mind behind uh, uh, the person that is maybe angry towards some person. And Jesus comes along to change that. The second thing we need to understand is, and, and I keep mixing my words up a little bit, Jesus is talking about murder and not killing. There are two distinct categories here, and we have to kind of explain this, you know, in the sense that sometimes uh, killing is done as an act of self-defense. And, and this is not an intent of murder. This is different. There are also other times, as biblically speaking, we have just wars, where God, even in the Old Testament, would call them into battle to rid the land of unrighteousness, and there would be killing in that sense. And then also we have, in, in, even in the law of Moses, we see capital punishment as a, a punishment for certain sins, including murder. So there is a difference. We have to separate the understanding of murder versus killing. And Jesus is dealing with murder. And he's saying, murder is bad. He says, but you have to check your heart in the first place because you can walk in the sense of anger 
that is just ungodly and unrighteous as murder itself. And I think that's where sometimes we find ourselves struggling with the word of God. Is that we're content with keeping the bare minimum and Jesus' desire is to keep our heart in alignment with his. His desire is to make sure that right here we're in alignment. And, and not that we're standing next to alignment. Yeah. Don't murder. I didn't murder that guy. I wanted to, but I didn't murder that guy. And Jesus said, no, 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 you're not. That's not alignment. Get your heart in alignment with me. He says, if you're angry with your brother or sister, you too are, are in danger or, or, or subject should be, you know, see to be placed under the judgment of God. The word, the term brother and sister that we see there is, is usually a term referring to those within the common faith amongst the people. So like those that were believers and disciples. But I would, I would challenge the thought that would limit it only to disciples of Jesus, but that Jesus is even speaking a broader term that would be towards any other person. That if you have anger in your heart to an extent that says, I want them dead, I wish they were dead, I wish I could kill them, or, or even leading to the place of murder, Jesus is saying, your heart is not right. Your heart needs to come into alignment. Dealing with anger and understanding anger as a sin sometimes is a hard thing because we have those moments where we feel anger rise up and Jesus is saying, I've called you to be a people of peace. So setting aside our anger causes us to remove the selfish nature of humanity to say, okay, this isn't about me feeling justified or me finding uh, the right end to this situation, but this is me seeking the peace that God has called me to seek. Putting aside our anger is a part of putting aside self. So Jesus goes on to say, even the words that you use towards others and what you call them can place you in position for the judgment to place you in position of hell Jesus uses two different words and, and, and he, the word raka doesn't get translated because there's not a good translation uh, in the English from the Aramaic but it's kind of like a quasi swear word that would be used in that Jewish world in the Aramaic and, and raka would mean something kind of like stupid or empty headed. So it's, it's this derogatory statement but it's a little harsher uh, than when your four year old tells your six year old you're stupid, right? It's a little more than that which we ended quickly in our home, just in case you're wondering. So if you hear my children calling each other stupid, let me know. We dealt with that like a decade ago. So eight years, whatever it is. So we have the word raka. The other word that we have, he says, uh, saying you fool. And then that word fool is the word moros, which is where we get the word moron uh, that we use, and which is a fun thing to know. It'd be like, well, uh, do you know the root word for moron? It's the Aramaic word for moros. Okay. Anyways. And what does that mean? So the, the word here carries a little bit of a different, we use the word a lot of time in, in a funny context, like, my guy is such a moron, right? And we kind of laugh off the word. Jesus here, the word that's being used is, it carries a, a, an understanding of kind of like an immoral, godless idiot. So when Jesus says you're calling somebody an immoral, godless idiot, he, he's like, he, he's saying, you're, you're saying something much harsher than what our mind immediately goes to. And be like, well, I've, I've said somebody was a fool before. And it's like, understand we're working on the heart and the intent in, in this moment. So essentially what's happening, we're here, here, let's talk about the heart in these statements and in this moment for a moment. Because a lot of times when we become so angry with somebody that it leads us to calling them names and, and belittling and demeaning and tearing them down, it, it basically is, is uh, confirming our ideas and our thoughts inwardly that they are not worth anything, that they are zero, that they are less than. And the reality is any person you're speaking those things to is a very human being that was created in the image of God. And so by stating somebody is worthless or less than that they are a fool or that they are incapable or they're doing things in a way that they, they never make it happen, when you begin to demean and tear down, you are literally speaking about the creation created in the very image of God. So begin to allow your minds to understand that your anger is now leading you to speak against God's handiwork. 
which is why the Lord is saying, don't, let your, don't, don't, don't think you're good just because you're angry and you didn't actually kill. Because a lot of times in our words, what is our intent? To tear them down, to diminish their ability and reputation. And a lot of times this is happening here. Your reputation in a lot of cases is your business. Your reputation is your ability to move forward. And so when you begin to kill somebody's reputation and their person, you may not be murdering them physically, but you are render, rendering them incapable of accomplishing and doing and providing and feeding their family family, providing home and shelter for their family. It is a killing and a tearing down through words. Why? Because of your anger that is not rooted in righteousness. Jesus said, no, 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 no. This goes beyond just murder. Understand my father's heart in the command in the first place. Don't even let there be anger amongst you, but seek peace and pursue it. Jesus says that you call someone a fool, you, you, you are subject to the fires of hell. The word hell there, and we'll see the word hell three different times and uh, two different references really in this passage today is the word Gehenna. And Gehenna is a place, it's a valley outside of Jerusalem. And, and long ago, it was a place where they practiced child sacrifice, the burning of children to the God of Molech. So it was a very evil, uh, a very, very demonic act that was being taken place out there. And then fast forward, King Josiah, who was a good king uh, in Israel, he, he re- kind of reclaims the place and he used that valley as the city dump. So the trash from Jerusalem would go out to this valley where it would be burned up. So there's fires burning in Gehenna. And so that was the word that they used and it gets translated to our word for hell. And we see Jesus speak about hell and the judgment of hell that will be. And, in, and he describes it as a place for the devil. He describes it as a place for his fallen angels and for those who are a- apart from the Lord, who have not received salvation, who have rejected Christ, who have rejected the Lord. And it's described often as a place of eternal fire and burning. Here's what we know about hell is that it is eternal separation and torment from God. Separation from God and torment. Let me clarify my statement. And we see Jesus saying, listen, our hearts have to be right with the Lord. Our hearts have to be right before God so that we remove ourselves from eternal judgment and step into eternal life. This is that continual challenge and the understanding of the law. As Jesus last week says, I've come to fulfill the law and this walking and the understanding of our righteousness being found in Christ. But even still in that, it is a call to align our hearts to the Lord. Because what does he go on to say? As you pick up in verse 23, he says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. The judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, that means pause, look back, and examine what was said because now the follow-up will come after the therefore of the the application or what we're called to do, right? So here Jesus says, listen, if you walk into worship, and so this would be in the context of temple worship that he's speaking to them. Then obviously the application changes a little here, but they would come in with their offering and their gift to, to sacrifice before the Lord and enter into worship. This is their act of worship. And he says, if you're about to sacrifice and make your offering and worship unto the Lord, and then you remember that there is somebody who has fault with you or you have fault with them, and there is this grievance between you, he said, just stop right there. Set aside your gift. Go and be reconciled with them. Then come back and present your offering and your worship to the Lord. Why? This goes back to to the, uh, the law and the understanding of temple worship. The gift that we are to bring to the Lord should be pure and spotless. 
And Jesus is saying, listen, if you have grievance between your brother or your sister, be reconciled so that your heart can be pure. What does he say in the Beatitudes? Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will be called children of God. And he's saying, come then pure in heart before me, reconciled with your brothers and sisters, walking in peace, and then present your worship. If you may have, you may have those moments where you feel that the wall and you're trying to enter into the presence of God, and you're like, Lord, what is the deal? What is the problem and the Lord keeps reminding you of the grievance that you have and the anger that you're carrying or the anger that somebody has stirring against you. He says, go and be reconciled first, then come back and step into the presence of the Lord and worship and feel the fullness of God. These things all work and tie together in our understanding of what it means to be near to the Lord. He says, go and be reconciled. Settle matters quickly. Don't let it linger. Don't let it hang because it needs to be resolved. Here's what I've learned. A lot of times we will have a grievance towards someone and they don't even know that there's something wrong. They will do something that we perceive as a slight or something that we perceive as they just shrugged me off. They don't even know they did it. And then what happens is if we don't settle matters quickly, we begin to allow these thoughts to begin to grow and develop in our minds. The scenario is now much larger. It runs much deeper. And in our minds, they're gathering up their whole posse to come against us. And all the while, they have no idea that you are now upset with them or that anything has ever happened. And so they just, they see you and then they smile and they're like, hi, how are you? And you're going, they are so fake right now. I know they hate me on the inside. And you're like, they're like, what, what, what? Jesus, settle matters quickly. Here's the other thing I want you to see that Jesus says too. He says, leave your gift there. Who does he tell you to go to? The person you are at fault with or the person you have grievance with. He does not say, go and ask for wisdom from somebody else first and then go and talk. You know why? Because that now leans into gossip. The Bible has given clear and explicit instructions on how to handle issues amongst brothers and sisters. You go to that person. If they don't hear you, then you come back with somebody else. The first step, so if you come to me as your pastor, I'm just gonna go ahead and answer this question for you right now. If you come to me and you're like, pastor, uh, I've really got a problem with this person and I just need to know what to do. You know what I'm gonna ask you? Have you talked to them yet? And if you say no, I'm gonna say, then we're done talking. And I say that in love because that's the word of God. And if I don't say it in love, then I'm just a jerk and I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm trying to point you to Jesus. But if you go, well, what should I do? And I'm gonna, okay, really simple. Go talk to them instead. Settle those matters, right? We don't need the anger developing and, and, and dwelling within us. You know what it leads to? Bitterness. And here's what happens. When bitterness sets root in our hearts, we now have anger towards this person over here, but now we're root, we have a root of bitterness in our heart. You know what it does? It then creates a veil in which we see everything else in. So now you've got this other person who has no fault or grievance against you. You go and try to have a relationship with them and you don't let them in and they're going, what is the deal? What is going on? And your mind, you're going, they're gonna hurt me. They're gonna wrong me. Why? Because you've not dealt with the matter of the anger and the bitterness rooted in your heart over here. So now it's affecting everything else over here. So Jesus says, settle matters quickly. As far as you're able to. There are gonna be times, I understand, where you're gonna do your best. This goes back to the intent of the heart. You're gonna try to deal with it. You're gonna try to resolve it. You're gonna go and you're gonna speak and they're just not gonna have it. And in those moments, be at peace with the Lord and move forward. So walk with the understanding. The other thing is this. Jesus is not talking about righteous anger. I love the New King James uses a great phrase because they didn't get rid of it from, from the King James. And they say, righteous indignation. That's a great word. The Bible tells us that Jesus is a great example of this for us in, in the temple. And he comes into the temple and, and there's they're, the money changers and, and all of these things going on. And Jesus looks and he sees, and the Bible says that he becomes indignant. That's a great word when it's done correctly. So what happens? Jesus says, my, the, my, my father's house will be called a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. And so Jesus comes in in righteous indignation. He begins to flip the tables over and drive them out with the whip, right? This is a godly moment. And you go, but Jesus said anger. No, 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 no. This is anger that is, is directed towards an offense to God. 
This is now against the word of God. This is against God himself. And in that, feel free to walk in anger and in a righteous way that is directed in a righteous way that looks to resolve and to point things back to righteousness. Jesus, it becomes righteously indignant. And I always joke that I hope in heaven that they have some sort of playback device because I want to watch that moment. I'm like, y'all, did y'all see Jesus get for real mad? Like there was one time he was a little mad and it was kind of like, ooh, you're out of line because Jesus is upset and he doesn't get upset except for when it's righteous. And, and then there's that one moment where he's flipping tables and I'm like, no, that's, that's like real Jesus anger. And I'm like, anyways, there's a difference. Let's continue. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. The second thing you know, it's disciples of Jesus walk with self-control. It's one of the fruits of the spirit. I uh, I had a a pastor that I, I worked for at one point and he did a whole message series on the fruit of the spirit. And he just constantly would just say, number nine, that's in the listing in the order. Self-control is the ninth one listed. So he'd always be like, oop, they need a little number nine. That was constant. He said that all the time. Disciples of Jesus walk with self-control. Again, Jesus is not trying to do away with the understanding of adultery as being law. That's a good thing, right? We can agree that adultery is a bad thing. Amen. That was a quicker response than first service. Listen, we had to work to get them there. (laughs) They were in agreement. They were just tired. It's good. Jesus is not trying to come around and be like, no, guys, listen, really, this is, no, no, no. What he's doing is he's completely, again, undergirding and strengthening this law. He's he's strengthening the, the understanding. He's bringing it back to the intent of God's heart. He was like, this is what is written, but this is the heart of God behind this. This is what we're seeing over and over and over again. The same would be said again with the Pharisees where there's this very, very broad understanding of sexual purity and a very narrow space of understanding sexual morality. And this is the same kind of thing being taught where as long as you have not committed physical adultery, then you are, are good uh, and you are righteous and you have kept the law. This is essentially the teaching that is being given and being passed on from the Pharisees is just this reality of, of how, how, what is the bare minimum necessary to keep the law? And Jesus is going, we have completely missed the heart of the matter if the goal is to just see how close to the line we can get. Jesus is saying, this is the heart. This is about keeping your hearts right, keeping your hearts pure before the Lord. And so the Pharisees essentially say, as long as there's no physical contact, then it doesn't matter what happens in your mind, in your thoughts, and with your eyes. None of that matters as long as you did not have a physical affair or commit adultery physically. And Jesus is going, you are out of your ever-loving mind if you think that's the way it is intended to be. I wish Jesus would have said ever-loving mind. We don't have actual biblical proof of that. We just, it's just Ryan's interpretation. So what is he, what is, what is he saying here? He, he, he brings this, this argument and this understanding that, that, listen, your mind is just as capable of committing adultery as your body is. And when you have that perspective and you have it in a biblical way and an understanding, it shifts your thought of what is and what isn't adultery. Because now that opens the world to having a mental affair, to having an emotional affair, as well as a physical affair. And that in all three cases, it is still adultery. In all three cases, it is still uh, goes against the, the vows made before man and wife before the Lord. But let me make this, this clear, that Jesus is using one specific uh, example in this, but he is not making this simply and purely only a statement given to married men to, to, in their re- re- relationships towards other women. No, 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 no. 
This is given to all followers of Jesus at every nature and every point in relationship, whether they're single, whether they're married, whether they're male or whether they're female. He's saying it doesn't matter if you are a male struggling with, with how you're looking at a female or a female with how you're looking at a male. It, is, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't matter. If I can get words together, I'll say it. That's how that just went. I'm just going to wait on the interpretation. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. There's a little Pentecostal joke for you. I don't know. <laughs> In case you don't know, I am Pentecostal, so it's like I'm not making fun of anybody else. But okay, just, just bring clarity. I just, just bring some clarity here. <laughs> it's, really, it's really bad when you feel like you have to backtrack eight steps to clarify your joke. Like, maybe you shouldn't make the joke. Let's just move on. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that what your eyes take in, if you allow to dwell, will begin to lean into lustful thoughts, which what, what is that? That would be thoughts that have sexual desires towards another. And he said, and in those things in your heart, you have already committed adultery as you've pondered and dwelt on these ideas and these thoughts. And here's the thing you say, well, I'm not married. So what effect does that have? You drag that and carry that with you into marriage and you have built up for yourself expectations that are unrealistic and unattainable, which then later brings in destruction and difficulty in the marriage. So Jesus is saying, get it right now. Fix what you look at. Fix what your heart dwells on. Fix what your heart ponders and leans into. Correct it and get it right. It is far more than, there's the sentiment of society today. And I've heard even women say it to their husbands. He can look as long as he doesn't touch. And women, if you have said that to your husband, let me encourage you to take it all back. Because the looking does nothing for anyone other than the looker. It reduces the object of the looking to just that, simply an object. And women, if you find yourselves looking and justifying it to say, well, it doesn't matter because at least I'm not a man and looking, it, it does not matter. We have to get lustful thoughts, ideas, and minds under control and in check. And here's the beauty of it. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. If you try to walk that world on your own, you will fail 10 times out of 10. But by the power and the grace of God, you can overcome and you can have victory. And it does not have to be the story of your life. It doesn't have to be the story of your marriage. It doesn't have to be the story of your future but you can walk in the freedom of the Lord as he brings complete deliverance from lustful thoughts and ideas. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. This is the part of scripture that's the least obeyed. Uh, I don't believe Jesus is being literal in this moment in case we're just in case you are wondering like, wow, this guy is serious. No, I think Jesus is clearly speaking metaphorically. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. I have a joke about throwing my right hand left-handed and how goofy I would look, but I'm not, I just, it's, I'm gonna stay on task here. Job, when he, when he writes, he, he talks about having a covenant with his eyes. And I'm going to paraphrase. He says, uh, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And he goes on to say, how then could I look upon a virgin? Then he spoke of his heart. He says, if my heart has gone after my eyes, if my heart has been enticed to a woman, he would then acknowledge that he had sinned and deserved the judgment of God. And if you know the story of Job, he goes on to say, but, but I've not found, I, I can't find where I've done this, why he had created and made a covenant with his eyes that, that I'm not gonna look where I shouldn't look. John Stott does a great job uh, clarifying uh, some of Jesus's ideas here. And he says, what does this involve in practice? Let me elaborate and so interpret Jesus' teaching. If your eye causes you to sin because temptation comes back to you through your eyes, objects you see, then pluck out your eyes. This is, don't look. Behave as if you had actually plucked out your eyes and flung them away and were now blind and so could not see the object which previously caused you to sin. 
So he's saying, Jesus is saying, act as if you do not have the ability to keep looking. Act as if you don't have the ability to keep on walking in this sin. Treat yourself as if my eyes have been plucked out. My hands have been cut off. I cannot indulge. Why eyes to hands? Why? Because what you see begins to filtrate your mind and begin to, to incorporate into your thought process to ultimately you act out upon it. And he's saying, so, so the, the adultery is committed in the mind first before it's even ever acted out physically. Stephen Covey, who's the author of the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he's known for making this statement where he says, that every action is created twice. It's first in the mind, and then it's created in the physical world, right? Then it's actually made it. And so Jesus here is taking, uh, or Covey is kind of taking that principle and that mindset from Jesus in this thought that, that shift your heart and your mind first, and we never have to worry about the latter, if your anger is under control now, we never worry about murder being an issue later. If, if lust in your heart and your mind are in control and in check now, we never have to worry about adultery and sexual immorality later. So there is this, this call from Jesus to have our hearts aligned with his, to be made like him. And he challenges us to make extreme changes if necessary so that we don't continue to fall prey and fall victim to the same sin over and over and over again. So if your eyes cause you to sin, stop looking. If your hand causes you to sin, don't do it. If your feet cause you to sin, don't go. Make changes do things. This is, this is that, that, that continued growth in, in righteousness and that continued training in righteousness. That there are things that we literally have to do in the physical sense as we become more and more like Christ. That there are parameters and boundaries that, that we place in, in, in order to walk closer to Jesus, to be a disciple of Christ. Yes, through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in us, but we also have a mind that's been given to us by Christ as it's been renewed to be able to take proper steps and understanding to be able to walk in righteousness. To allow the anger to fall off because we're not trying to satisfy a selfish desire to be right or for justification that is not ours to give or to keep our eyes and our minds under control as it pertains to lust so that our minds are filled with the thoughts of Christ and not with desires of the flesh to come into alignment. I'll invite Peyton to join me. I know when you come to church, the hope is that you leave encouraged and excited, built up, but here's my encouragement to you. That when you find freedom, there is nothing like it. It's easy to give in to the indulgence of the flesh for a one time in the immediate, but it is fleeting and the joy is fake and not lasting but there is something so wonderful about the freedom of Christ. There is something so wonderful about the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that comes from walking in step with a heart aligned to who Jesus is. This is what Christ is calling us to. A life that is different than the rest of the world around us. We live in a world that has this you do you mentality, which is rooted at the heart in selfishness. And this mindset that says, whatever makes you happy, whatever. And Jesus is saying, that is a mindset that has you sitting on the throne. That when I'm placed on the throne of my heart, it is about what does Ryan want? What does Ryan feel like he deserves? What does Ryan want to pursue? And none of that will ever fully line up with the word of God. It just can't. I am a flawed human. I am imperfect. So my ideas and my thoughts, my desires will be imperfect. 
But when I step off the throne and I allow Jesus to take the place of of king of my life and my heart, all of a sudden now I can look to him and say, what do you want? What is it that you have for me? And I can fully surrender to Jesus to be Lord over my life. And in that, he allows my thoughts and my mind and my heart to come into alignment with him, that I begin to walk as a disciple who seeks peace and pursues it and doesn't pursue angry ambition, but I can walk in self-control in my thoughts and actions as I allow him to lead and to guide, to shape and transform through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's his desire for every one of us. Father, I love you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the correction from your word. God, I thank you for the rebuke of your word, for the challenge of your word and the desire to become more like you. Lord, at at times the word of God seems so uh, difficult. Lord, I thank you for your spirit that, that helps us to understand, for your spirit that helps us to correct and to change, for your spirit that molds and shapes. God, I thank you that your word doesn't hold back, but deals with issues of our heart and our mind and not just of issues of the physical world. So Father, I pray right now for any heart that is wrestling with thoughts and ideas, the heart that maybe the spirit is, is working on, that there is some level of conviction and challenge taking place internally. And even those, Lord, that as I have spoken this morning, your Holy Spirit has just begun to bring revelation and insight to their own heart. God, I pray for those that, that have had the underlying anger that they've not even been aware of, that they've suppressed for so long, that as I've been preaching today, your Holy Spirit has just been just poking at their heart and revealing areas of anger that have been left unresolved and buried to a, a place of, of depth that is hard to understand. So Lord, I pray that in this moment right now, if you're speaking to hearts that are, are dealing with anger, Lord, that you just begin to allow them to, to feel the grace of God and the love of Jesus, that, that your intent and your heart in this moment is not to embarrass them or to make them feel less than, but to set them free. And then Father, for those that are walking and struggling and dealing with, with lust, desiring what is not theirs to be desired. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that all sense of shame and guilt would only be that that is the work of the conviction of the spirit and not the condemnation of the enemy, but that you would clothe them in grace and righteousness in this moment and that all shame and guilt would begin to fall away as they would begin to understand your grace as they bring it to light. Lord, as they come with repentant heart and say, oh God, remove this from me. Help me, Lord. This morning, what I wanna do is, is, is just to say, if you are, as I'm speaking and the Lord has just spoken to your heart and says, man, that's me, I need to deal with that. And it could be anger, it could be lust, it could be both. And you say, Pastor Ryan, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Here's what I want you to do. It's real simple. I just want you to lift your hand and I want to pray for you. And, and it's not so that I'm aware. I understand this. It's a simple acknowledgement of heart to the Lord. Say, God, I see that you're speaking to me. If that's you, just lift your hand. One, two, three. Everywhere, 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 everywhere. So here's what we're going to do. Jesus, right now, I pray, oh God, Lord, let this be a place of freedom. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray that there are stories that are going to come from this moment. Lord, we've said over and over that today will be a day that many mark down in their calendars as a day that God did something. Lord, I pray for those that have just raised their hand in acknowledgement to to anger or to lust, Lord, or even to both. And I pray in the name of Jesus that this is a day where they begin to just fall off of them. Lord, that the things that want to grip on and hold tight that are not of you, Lord, that they have to release, they have to let go, that because, because the Spirit of the Lord dwells, they 
have no place or authority in their hearts and their lives any longer, but they have to fall away and that there is freedom, oh God. Lord, let your freedom dwell in their hearts and in their lives and in their minds, no longer bound by the things that have kept them back from the fullness of your presence, that have kept them from the fullness of the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that wants to reign in their hearts and their lives. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let them be gone. Let them walk in freedom. Let them walk in freedom in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The second thing I want you to do if you raise your hand, and this is the big step. This is the challenge that, that, that you're going to have to take. And, and it's not something that necessarily is going to be done here in this moment, but it's a challenge that you really need to do. James tells us this, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. Find someone that you know you can trust that can hold you accountable, that you can go and say, I need to confess this. I, I need to get this off of my chest. There, there are moments in my life of, of, of repentance that have also been accompanied with confession uh, where I've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, you see my heart and I confess that, but then knowing that I still need to go further with it and carry it uh, to others. A lot of times it's my wife. And if there are things, and let me challenge you in this just as good practice, because in the marriage, it should be the safest place in which you can share and communicate. And so if you raised your hand and you would say, man, it, it was lust that I was raising my hand for, go and you're married, go to your spouse with that. And there may be some struggles you have to walk through from that. I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. There may be some difficulty and some healing that has to come, but here's my encouragement, give grace, Okay give love, give support, strengthen one another. Amen? There may be hurt that comes from those words. I, I, I'm understanding of that. But have, have the, the strength and the resolve to say, this is where I'm at. This is my struggle. Yeah, I'm gonna... I had to do that in our marriage. I've never shared this. Uh, I didn't share it in first service. Several years into marriage, I uh, started the slowest process of confession to my wife of, of struggle with lust that you've ever seen in your entire life. It started out one time, admitting to one time, coming back a few weeks later and trying to own it like, oh, I lied to you. I didn't tell you the whole truth and sharing three times or so of, of struggling with lust and moments and pornography. And it took me over a month to fully confess to my wife what God had already been dealing with in my heart. But can I tell you the joy of it? There's freedom. There's freedom. And I don't stand up here to boast in that, to make me sound better. or just, That's just to show my humanity and the reality. There is a reason why I encourage you to share it with your spouse because the greatest thing I could have ever done was to go to my wife. Was it the hardest thing I've ever done? Yes. Was it difficult in our marriage? Yes. It was tough months and months. My wife was blindsided with my sin. I was in this struggle of, man, I have found freedom. And yet at the same time, my wife is now carrying the weight and in, in, in the hurt that I just threw on her of years of hiding. But the grace of God, the goodness of the Lord, sustained us and carried us and brought us through to the other side. When we say this all the time. We have the greatest marriage we have ever had in our lives and it just keeps getting better and better. And it would not be had I just been a coward and hid behind my sin and continue to lie and embellish and make stories and stories and stories. But there was just, there's now of freedom. And if you want freedom, if you want true deliverance, you have to not just repent, but bring it with confession 
The Lord does an incredible work in that. Confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. We can get into that story at a deeper level at another time in a one-on-one conversation if you want. But that was almost a decade ago now. And God is good. Man. So all that to say, find someone. If you're married, go there. I encourage you. And it may be hard. But trust the Lord through it. If it's anger, find someone. Talk with them. Confess your sins one to another. Amen. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you allow your Holy Spirit to walk with us, to lead us, and to guide us in all things. We give you glory. We give you honor for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you. Have an incredible, incredible week. We will see you next Sunday as we continue in our series. The best is yet to come.